There was a very popular poker game that many of you have heard of and probably may have played. It's called Texas Hold'em. Uh, there's nothing really unique about Texas Hold'em. Uh, it is a simple game. The dealer deals each player two cards down, called the hole cards, H-O-L-E. These are called the hole cards for each player. Then in the center of the table, he deals five cards face down. The dealer then begins to turn the center cards over one at a time, and the, beget, the betting begins. The object for the players is to make the best five-card hand between the two hole cards they have plus the five cards in the center. Now, all the players can see the center cards the dealer has turned over, but the player's secret weapon is their two hole cards. That's where the expression ace in the hole comes from. A few years ago, Texas Hold'em, out of nowhere, became wildly popular. It reached fad status. Texas Hold'em tournaments were broadcast nationally and sometimes internationally. Uh, they even had commentators who would talk in golf voices uh, and give you a play-by-play -play as they played their poker hands. I mean, who knew that poker was a uh, uh, spectator sport? Um, the players became what you might call superstar status. And of course, they started dressing the part. And my favorite, and it was ridiculous, my favorite was they'd wear a hoodie and those big aviator sunglasses, the reflective ones, and they would sit at the table, the poker table, and they'd look all uh, smug, a little sinister, uh, secretive, uh, all-knowing as they played the game. To me, they just looked like big praying mantises sitting there. <laughs> um, at the very zenith of the popularity of Texas Hold'em, I mean, Texas Hold'em was uh, replacing uh, Canasta and Bridge at senior citizen centers all over the country. And at its very zenith, Texas Hold'em actually became almost a main character in a blockbuster James Bond 007 seven film uh, called Casino Royale. Now, I know y'all are probably sitting there thinking, I think the good deacon bumped his head before he started writing the sermon. In our gospel reading today, and in other gospels, the game the Pharisees are playing with Jesus reminds me of a game of poker, of Texas Hold'em. The Pharisees are smug, secretive, all-knowing. Their challenges to Jesus are like a game, and through their arrogance, which is fueled by their greed and the desperation to maintain power, they think they are always holding the winning hand. They think because of their position of power and their enormous wealth, they will always have the winning hand. They think they will always win. They think that God would never let them lose. In a way, you kind of have to pity them. They always lose. Because of their arrogance, though, and their greed and lust for power, once again, it, com it completely blinds them from the truth. It blinds them from accepting the fact that, the, that their opponent in this poker game, that they are so self-assured they will win, is God himself. You don't play poker with God. In St. Matthew's Gospel, the Pharisees are convinced that they have the better hand with Jesus. They are convinced that they will beat him this time. So convinced, they invite the Herodians to play. Verse 16, and this is from the NIV. They sent their disciples to him along with Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Now, there are different, differing theories and uh, there's some you know, minor debate, historical debate of exactly who the Herodians were. But the general consensus by most scholars is they were a political power during the time of Jesus. It is generally agreed that they were a Jewish political party that supported the dynasty of Herod the Great, Rome's ruling family over much of the land of the Jews. Now, the Pharisees and the Herodians were not allies, quite the opposite. The Herodians believed that in submitting to King Herod, therefore submitting to Rome, which to them was the politically expedient thing to do. The Herodians' belief belied and compromised the Pharisees' goal of total Jewish independence. So it is obvious that they did not see eye to eye except for one thing. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Verse 17, also from the NIV. 
Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now this is where they just know they have won the game. Because the or not is what they think is their ace in the hole. If he answers no, he's publicly preaching sedition, even rebellion, against Rome. The Herodians would, of course, take immediate action, scampering off directly to King Herod or even the local Roman garrison, decrying this prophet Jesus as an imminent threat to Roman rule. This, of course, would trigger his immediate arrest, imprisonment, or even execution. Game over. Problem solved. If he answers yes, he is openly preaching against the temple, against the law, exposing himself as a dangerous false prophet, preaching the heresy that Roman rule of law supersedes God's law. The Pharisees would easily make the case that such heresy is punishable by banishment, imprisonment, or even stoning. Game over. Problem solved. Remember, you don't gamble with God. Verse 18 through 21. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought to him the denarius, and he asked, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God. God's. Game over. In our relationship with God, we talk to him a lot through prayer, our liturgy, and of course through our actions. And are at times in this relationship going to ask questions many times on whether he is even going to be talking back to us. Why can't I hear him? I really need some answers. I want the right answers. He does speak to us in prayer, and I've talked about how we have to really truly listen. He speaks through, to us through our liturgy. And yes, he speaks through us and to others in our actions. Our conversations with God really started right here. And it continues there. It doesn't matter how many times we read a particular verse chapter or entire book of the Holy Word, of His Holy Word, the conversation is always different. He gives us our answers with the truth through His Holy Word. A year from now, when we read and meditate on this same Gospel of St. Matthew, our conversation with God will be totally different than the one we have with Him today. The real beauty is that He speaks to us each individually, talking directly into our hearts, giving us the answers we each individually need, and many times not the ones that we really want. So what is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ trying to tell us in verse 21? Some of the commentaries on the web, as I said, the web's a scary place, are pretty wild. Uh, of course, the most popular is that Jesus is clearly commanding us that we are obligated to pay taxes. Now, this was a who. There was a website for Bishop Caesar's Temple of Universal Enrichment. <laughs> and yes, you guessed it. What do y'all think his tagline was for fundraising? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You gotta give credit what credit to do. Um, now the first part of the verse seems pretty obvious. The coin has Caesar's face on it. He made it. It belongs to him. So what are we to give to God what is God's? Now here is the answer he gave me. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, still from the NIV. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Jesus is simply telling us that the stuff of this world doesn't really matter. He's not saying that it is evil, but it's just money, stuff. And in the end, in the end, we will give it, end up giving it all back because it was made this by this world, so it belongs to this world. His command is simple. God made us. We are his. We are his most beloved and cherished possessions. We, as his children, only have to give ourselves to him. Now, we did at our baptism. We committed ourselves to continue doing so through the church at our confirmation. All of us here that are married mutually gave ourselves to our spouses and mutually gave ourselves to God in the sacrament of holy matrimony. Most importantly, we give ourselves to him every Sunday when we partake in the sacrament of holy communion. 
and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. Now, is this all we have to give? Have we given enough? Maybe, maybe not. I have no idea. None of us do. He will be the final judge of that. There is one, there is one thing that is unique about the, uh, the game of Texas Hold'em. Now, in all traditional other games of poker, there are betting limits. There are minimums and maximums that you can bet. In Texas Hold'em, the player can make the boldest, scariest of all wagers. They can go all in. They bet it all. This wager takes courage because, remember, they can't see the other player's hold cards. So they are committing themselves completely and wholly with unanswered questions and with unknowns. I challenge us all today to be all-in Christians, all-in Anglicans, not just on Sundays, but every morning to try our best to challenge ourselves to be all-in of our giving of ourselves to God. From the time we awake until the time we lay our heads back on the pillow, to be all-in in our love and for and our faith in our God, to strive each and every day to be all and by the living righteous and Christian's lives. To not fear the unknown every day brings. That knowing in our hearts that by giving ourselves wholly and completely to God, each and every day, He alone can fill that void and vanquish that fear of the unknown. Will we achieve it? Every day or even at all? Probably not. But dearly beloved, just by even, even trying each and every day, God will richly bless us and the people we come in contact to and bring us joy in all that we do. I'd like to conclude with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Amen. And with thy spirit. spirit. Let us pray. O oh, our God, we believe in thee. Do thou strengthen our faith. All our hopes are in thee. Do thou secure them. We love thee with our whole hearts. Teach us to love thee daily more and more. We are sorry that we have offended thee. Do thou increase our sorrow. We adore thee as our first beginning. We aspire after thee as our last end. We give thee thanks as our constant benefactor. We call upon thee as our sovereign protector. Vouchsafe, O our God, to conduct us by thy wisdom, to restrain us by thy justice, to comfort us by thy mercy to defend us by thy power. To thee we desire to consecrate all our thoughts, words, actions, and sufferings, that henceforth we may think of thee, speak of thee, constantly refer all our actions to thy greater glory, and suffer willingly whatever thou shalt allow us to suffer. Lord, we desire that in all things thy will may be done, because it is thy will in a matter thou willest, and as long as thou willest it. We beg of thee to enlighten our understanding, to inflame our will, to purify our bodies, and to sanctify our souls. Amen. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, and he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive.